Chapter 18 Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me five times, I'm a fucking jerk. With the temperatures rising, the summer a few weeks away, the unemployment deposits coming in regularly, and the weed sales better than ever, I was doing great. The unemployment paid even more than the disability because I had never collected so I was getting the most money per week you could possibly receive. All I had to do was fill out a list of places I applied to every two weeks and mail it in. Instead of going door to door and filling out applications, I'd get online and call around to different restaurants, bookshops, and retail stores to inquire if they were hiring. Most often they'd say no, as the economy was still recovering, albeit ever so slowly. I was even making real progress on the documentary. An old friend of mine named Mickey Grant had found me on Facebook and was interested in helping me edit the film. I met Mickey at the same time I met Ray at the Improv in Hollywood when we were all just kids. He was a crazy drunk son of a bitch, but honest and forthright, with a dry, Bill Murray-esque sense of humor. He had been learning editing and had gotten pretty good at it. Plus he said he'd help me for free, which was great since I didn't have enough money to pay someone to do it. He'd come down from Hollywood on the train and we'd work on edits for hours. Things were really shaping up. We even discussed starting a little video production business to make extra money. I'd write and direct and he would shoot and edit. I was excited about all of it. Lourdes and I were in full swing again and things were going well. She asked me to take her and the baby grocery shopping one day because their SUV had broken down. I picked them up in front of their place. The butcher was sitting on a beach chair in their front yard, looking disheveled and unshaven. He had mustard stains on his shirt and was obviously drunk. Thanks for taking my girl shopping, fat boy. Just try not to eat all our groceries before we get them home. <laughs> he chuckled. I thought to myself, very funny. I'll try my best, but I can't promise I won't pound a quart of cum down your wife's throat for the 150th time. So hook it up there, Chuckles. I stood there smiling at him with a big shit-eating grin on my face. Poor cocksucker. He was still so self-assured and full of himself. He had no idea I was defiling his wife daily in every conceivable way known to mankind. He could insult my appearance all day long, and I could take it with a smile from ear to ear. All the fat jokes in the world couldn't take away from the fact that I was fucking the mother of his child. It was quite a gift from the gods. As sweet as my good fortune had been, Uncle Roberts had been bitter and ugly. He and his girlfriend had had a vicious fight after a drunken night, and she went to live in a sober living house. His landlords unlocked his door one day and came in. He came out of the bathroom and they told him he wasn't supposed to be there, that they had hired a cleaning crew to gut the place so they could put it up for rent. They informed him that he was never on the lease and now that his girlfriend had moved out, he'd have to leave. They told him he'd have to be out in two weeks. A day later, they taped a notice to vacate on his front door. I took him to court to try and fight it. He had receipts for the rent he paid with checks they accepted, but that wasn't enough. The judge told him that he was never on the lease and that the owners had the right to evict him at any time, even though they had accepted payments from him. They just wanted to get all the druggy burnouts out of their building so they could rent the rooms out for more money to all the young trust fund hipsters that were invading the area. To make matters worse, their building had been recently infested with bed bugs. I stopped letting Robert get in my car or come over to my place because of it. I wasn't about to have those little fuckers invading my place. There had been an outbreak of bed bugs all over the country, and from what I heard, they were nearly impossible to get rid of. Robert had given up completely. His appearance went to shit even worse than it already had. He stopped shaving, cutting his hair, taking a shower, or even leaving his place. He tried getting into some retirement homes around the neighborhood, but no one would rent to him. All they'd have to do is take one look at him and know he was too shady to rent to. And with an eviction hanging over his head, there was no place in the whole state that would rent to him. A friend of his offered up his mini camper. It was just rotting in his front yard. It was full of garbage and had no running water or electricity. He had no other options, so he was seriously considering it. 
I had to do something for him. I called my buddy Roger at the American Hotel. He had been a longtime resident and took up as the new building manager. I told him the situation, that Robert had nowhere else to go, that he had a guaranteed income, and that I was in charge of his money and would make sure his rent was paid on time. And being that I had such good standing in the neighborhood, he agreed to take him in. Now all I had to do was convince Robert. He had been in Long Beach for over a dozen years. All his favorite bars and liquor stores, his favorite places to eat, all his friends, his methadone clinic, his whole support system was there. All the apartments he tried to get into were in the immediate area because he wanted to stay close to what he knew. But there were simply no other alternatives. I went up to Robert's window, which faced the street. I looked in to see him hunched over in his chair. His hair was long and hanging in his face, and his clothes, a pair of boxers and a wife beater, were sweaty and stained. The room was littered with trash and dirty dishes. I knocked hard on the window. He didn't even look up to see where the sound was coming from. It was clear he was simply shutting down not coping well with his circumstances. I banged even harder, which finally woke him up. I gestured for him to go to the front door. There was no way in hell I was going in his room with a bed bug infestation lingering about. He got up slowly and stumbled out to the front stoop. I told him that I had arranged for a room at the American and that it was his if he wanted it. You ain't sticking me in no skid row slum, goddamn you. He spat. His only memories of downtown L.A. was getting out of the Hall of Justice jail and walking through Skid Road to the Greyhound bus stop to catch a bus home. He had no idea how gentrified it had become. It's not like that anymore, Uncle Robert. It's a nice place. Lots of fun things going on all the time. And lots of nice people your own age that you can hang with. The Dash bus is only a quarter and can get you up to Dodger Stadium in 15 minutes to see a game. There are great places to eat and art fairs right outside your door. It's a good place for you, and once you see it, you're going to love it, I promise. Just come with me tomorrow and check it out. Meet the manager and see what it's really like. He agreed, but reluctantly. I showed up the next day to see that the curtains on the windows were shut. I knocked on the window. There was no response. I knocked again, louder this time. Nothing. I called his cell phone. I heard it ringing inside his apartment, so I know he was in there. I went to his front door and knocked. I heard him shuffling around. God damn you, I know you're in there, old man. I can hear you. We have to meet the manager at the hotel in a couple hours, so open up, man. I'm not going away till you open this door. Then I heard him stumbling around and walking to the door. When he opened it, I was hit in the face with the smell of whiskey. He was standing there in his underwear, staggering drunk. His eyes were bloodshot red, his hair was long and messy, and he could barely stand up. I can't do this, Christian. Why are you forcing me to do something I don't want to do? I took five Vicodin, my methadone, and drank a fifth of Jack Daniels. I can't go on, man. I want to die. Just let me die. I'm not forcing you to do anything. I'm here to help you. Because the cops are going to be here in 48 hours to kick you and all your shit onto the street. And no one else is going to take you in. I can't have you live at my place. It's too small. I promise, if you don't like the hotel, I'll leave you to do whatever you like. His underwear were falling off of him because he hadn't been eating and was getting even thinner than he already was. I reached down and pulled them up. There were shit stains in them. I found a pair of pants and put them on him, then some shoes, and found a clean shirt and pulled it over his head. I walked him out to my car and drove him to the nearest supercuts to get cleaned up. We could see some Asian women inside cutting hair. I ain't letting some zipperhead bitch cut my hair. Take me home, barked Uncle Robert. Look, motherfucker, I've about had enough of your shit. Last night I called a government agency that helps house elderly people who can't care for themselves. 
ones that they deem mentally ill or heavily addicted to drugs. And if I just took them into your place to see how you live and they get a hold of your record of incarceration and I tell them what you just told me about wanting to die, I could have you committed for observation. They can hold you for up to two weeks, then you'd be put out on the street with nowhere to go. Or you can play ball and get a nice little room in a hotel where I lived happily for 10 years and for a fraction of the price of what you pay now. So what's it going to be? You're as mean as a junkyard dog, you know that? You're just like your daddy. He finally agreed and we went in to get him looking presentable. While he was getting his shave and haircut, I went to a little Mexican joint next door and got him a burrito and a cup of coffee to sober him up. By the time I got back, the Asian lady had his face shaved, his mustache trimmed nicely, and his hair cut and combed back. He looked great. Oh, your uncle, very handsome man, said the Asian barber. He nodded his burrito and slurped at his coffee as we drove up the freeway into downtown. By the time we pulled up to Traction and Hewitt, he was mostly sober, at least able to stand. Roger met us at the front door and walked us up to the first floor. Ironically, the room that he was showing us was my very first room in the hotel, room 214. Not much had changed. The rooms and hallways looked and smelled the same. The bathrooms looked identical. Some of the same faces from the past appeared in the hallway, greeting me warmly. It was only then that I realized how long I had been gone. Some six years. Robert liked the room, especially how open and uncluttered it was, because it was just the opposite of his, which was a messy, crowded disaster zone. I took him around the block and showed him all the cool places to hang out and the best places to eat. His eyes lit up, and he became excited. I had convinced him. What a relief. The day we moved him in was a goddamn nightmare. He had barely packed anything. I would have preferred leaving everything behind. It was all just junk anyway, but he insisted. He also insisted that he didn't have bed bugs the way some of his neighbors did. And since he didn't have any bites on him, I took his word for it. I rented a U-Haul truck for him and pulled it right in front of his place. He'd bring out one shabbily packed box after another while I stacked them in the truck as neatly as I could. Then he got his cat Leo in his carrier and we put him in the front seat. I had given him back Abigail as well because she was tormenting Mona too much and was making her very unhappy. So she was packed away in her little carrier as well. When it came to the heavier things like the bed, the dresser, and his recliner... Uncle Robert would suddenly be stricken with terrible back pain, the fucking shyster. We got it all in eventually and drove him up to the hotel. By the time we got there, he was already exhausted. Loading the truck was probably more work than he had done in decades. I carried his recliner up and sat it down in his room. He promptly sat in it and fell fast asleep while I loaded the rest of his shit up all by myself. He woke up an hour later to find all his things sorted neatly around the room. I let the cats out of their carriers and handed Robert the keys and said, You're on your own from here on out, partner. Enjoy. And got the fuck out of there. I got back home and stripped down to my bare ass, shoved all my clothes into a trash bag, put on a clean pair of shorts and walked down to the trash bin in the alley and chucked them in. I didn't see any bed bugs, but I wasn't going to take any chances. I got in the shower and scrubbed myself down. When I got out, I heard my cell going off. It was Robert. Shit, man. We fucked up big time. I forgot my methadone. Can you please bring it to me? I can't go without it. I'll get real sick, man. Please. I was pissed. It had already been an exhausting few days convincing the son of a bitch to move in the first place, then doing most of the work to get him in there, and just babysitting him the whole time. And now he forgets the most important thing to him? I was fed up. God damn it, man. Not today. I'm fucking tired, and it's five o'clock traffic, and if I lose my spot now, I won't be able to park anywhere. 
You're just going to have to wait. I hung up. It was like dealing with a spoiled, petulant child. The next day, Lourdes came over and wanted to go out somewhere nice. I took her to lunch at my favorite all-you-can-eat sushi place. We walked on the beach after and then went back to my place where she gave me a nice sloppy blowjob. Then we took a nap and didn't wake up until it was dark. When Lourdes saw it was 10 p.m., she dashed out the door to get home. The butcher would be pissed that she was gone so long and she'd have a lot of explaining to do. I stretched out in bed and looked at my phone. I forgot that I turned it off when Lourdes showed up. I didn't want to hear the damn thing go off. If I was with her, I didn't want anyone disturbing our time together. When the phone came on, I was hit with one text message after another from Robert. I gasped. I had forgotten his methadone. I called him right away. He answered with a weak, whispering voice. Hey, youngster. Where have you been? I'm real sick, man. Real sick. Please bring me my stuff, bud, please. I feel like I'm gonna die. I'll be there right away. I jumped in my car, went to his old apartment, grabbed his little methadone carrier, and dashed up the 710 freeway into downtown. I knocked on his door. When he opened it, I couldn't believe my eyes. His face looked like he had been stung by a swarm of bees. It was so bad that his eyes were almost swollen shut. I just handed him the bag and shut the door. I couldn't believe what a physical dependence opioids had over his life. I left there feeling terrible. I got back into writing the screenplay for the documentary, mostly narrative and coordinating the photos with it. I called Mickey to see when he'd be available to come down and make some more edits, but he didn't answer. He was always pretty good about getting back to me if you missed my call. I leave him a message and he'd usually get back within minutes, but there was no response that day. I tried several times and he never got back. A week went by and I still hadn't heard from him. I went up to the hotel one day to pay Uncle Robert's rent and to take him grocery shopping. I dropped him back at the hotel afterwards and decided to go into Hollywood to Mickey's place to see if I could catch him at home. I knocked on his door, but there was no answer. I ran into one of his neighbors and asked her if she had seen him but she said she hadn't seen him in days. I started to get really worried. Then one day I hit up a mutual friend of ours on Facebook named Jason. I asked him if he had heard from Mickey. He wrote back immediately saying, Oh shit, you haven't heard? Mickey got hit by a drunk driver. They had to airlift him to a hospital in Mission Hills. They don't know if he's going to make it. You should talk to Danny. I think you guys are friends on here. Mickey was coming from his house when it happened. He's been at the hospital with him for the last few days. He'd have more details. I was absolutely shocked. My hands were shaking. I contacted our mutual friend Danny, and he gave me the rundown. Mickey was over at his place showing him a new camera he had just bought, a Canon 7D that he spent a grand on for a little video production company. On his way home, some degenerate drunk in a Chevy Ram pickup truck T-boned him going 80 miles per hour. Both vehicles flipped several times. The drunk landed on his tires and sped off. Mickey's car was sandwiched, bent in half. When the fire department showed up, they thought Mickey was dead for sure. But when they checked for a pulse, they found he was still alive. They airlifted him to Holy Cross. He suffered a massive head wound and was in an induced coma. The miraculous thing was, the only other injury he had was a broken collarbone. His spine was intact and there were no other broken bones. But the doctors couldn't tell us if he would ever be the same again. He could end up being a vegetable. When I went to visit him, they had drilled a hole in his head that had a tube sticking out of it. They said it was to relieve the pressure that was swelling in his brain. His face and head were bloated and black and blue. It was devastating to see. Back at home, I had my own troubles brewing. Lourdes was back on the fence about us again. 
This time it was about me being a dreamer, still trying to make a living in the arts. The way she saw it, I was talented, but there was still such a minuscule chance of making a living out of it that I was just wasting my time. But the way I saw it, if every artist that heard that same critique from someone had actually listened, there would be no famous artist. I told her that I was an artist when she met me 17 years ago, and I'll be an artist till the day I died. Her reply? Well, you're going to die alone then, because I'm not waiting around for you to be discovered. The chances are a billion to one. I think we need to stop this thing once and for all. But it wasn't the last time by a long shot. In fact, in the next three months, she came and went another two times, making five breakups and subsequent returns. And because I loved her so goddamn much, I kept letting her walk in and out of my life as much as it suited her. She'd show up with her six-pack wanting to have a drink and talk things out. And my dumb ass would always welcome her back with open arms, grateful and believing her with all my might when she'd say she was sure this time. As maddening as it all was, it all seemed pretty fucking trivial compared to what Mickey and Uncle Robert were going through. Mickey had since come out of his coma, but he had no memory. And I don't just mean of the accident. He had become completely brain wiped. He didn't know who he was, who any of us were, where he lived, what year it was, who was president, nothing. What was worse, the hospital could only keep him there a couple weeks more. He didn't have health insurance, and his bills were into the millions already. The best they could do for him was stick him in a convalescent home with a bunch of old people until he was well enough to go home. If he ever got completely well again, that is. They couldn't tell us for sure. Uncle Robert was adjusting well to his new surroundings, making friends with his neighbors, sitting around bullshitting with everyone in front of the coffee shop downstairs, flirting with young girls and passing around joints. But Roger called and said he'd sometimes see him shuffling around the hallways in his slippers and bathrobe, mumbling to himself or begging the neighbors for money and cigarettes. Roger felt like something was off with Robert. Not quite right. He'd have good days and then be back to acting kind of odd on others, almost delirious or something. All of this preyed on my mind. I felt like I could be doing more for them, and it was starting to come to my senses about Lourdes and her intentions with me. I always felt like I was walking on eggshells around her. I didn't know when she'd flip on me again, and every time she had so far was extremely hard on me. I really felt like it was killing me. That is no exaggeration. It felt like a slow death. My mom had brought me a bunch of VHS tapes that she found for sale at an old video store that was going out of business. There were a lot of great titles, but I didn't have a VCR anymore. Lourdes and the Butcher had one, though. I called her and asked her if she wanted them. She said yes and to bring them over, but warned me to act casual because the Butcher would be there with her and the baby. I brought them over and was walking up to their front door. I saw them through their front window, sitting on the couch together. She had a vacant look of total indifference on her face. Her little black eyes were blank and distant. She looked plumper than usual, like a fat little black widow that just got her hands on her mate and drained him of his blood. And following suit, the butcher sat with her on the other end of the couch, looking like a dead fly, unusually thin, sucked up, emaciated, exhausted. They both looked miserable. It gave me pause seeing them like that. They were unaware of my presence, not knowing that I was spying on them from out there, from outside the web that they were both stuck in. It was then and there that I decided to make a major change. I left the videotapes on their front porch and left. I texted her to let her know and drove home feeling good and certain of what I was about to do next. 
I had decided to put her devotion to the test once and for all. She came over one afternoon and I gave her the news. I told her that I had made the decision to move back to the American hotel. I had called Roger and told him to hold the next available room for me. I had to keep an eye on Uncle Robert. I had a feeling that he didn't have a whole lot of time left, and he simply didn't have anyone else that wanted to help him through all that. And Mike was about to be forced out of the convalescent home they stuck him in because they couldn't keep him there forever without the insurance to pay for it. He'd need someone to take him grocery shopping and to his doctor's appointments. He, too, had no one else that could be there for him regularly as his family lived back in Detroit. Danny helped when he could, but he worked and couldn't always be there at the drop of a hat. I could. I didn't have a job after all. She looked shocked. She knew that the whole reason I even moved to Long Beach was to win her love and marry her eventually. That was it. I had no other reason to be there. But I needed to know that no matter where I went, she would follow me to the ends of the earth the same way I would for her. If I moved downtown and wasn't just a short bike ride away, would she still stay with me and deal with all the responsibility I was about to undertake? Or would she dump me again? I figured I knew what the answer was, but I had to find out for sure. A couple weeks later, I rented a U-Haul and found myself moving on the 4th of July for the third time. Lourdes and Marty, the peckerwood I sold weed to every week, lent a hand and helped me load the truck. After selling so much of my stuff when my bosses were trying to fuck me out of my unemployment, there wasn't very much to move. We loaded everything I had in about an hour. We drove up to the hotel, Lourdes in the truck with me, and Marty following us in his truck, and loaded everything up to my room. The room was the smallest one in the whole building, about half the size of the regular rooms, which were already tiny by most people's standards. I could barely fit my bed in there, and actually had to give my recliner to Marty, because it simply didn't fit. I didn't have a choice. There were no other rooms available. I had to get in where I could until someone in one of the bigger rooms moved out. Mona was freaked. She whined and whimpered and fussed. She couldn't understand what we were doing in a virtual closet. I tried to comfort her as we laid on the bed together. I cuddled her and unpacked her snacks and gave her a few. I felt terrible putting her through it all, but I had to help my friend and my uncle. I put out her food and water and left her there and drove Lourdes home and then dropped the U-Haul truck off. I went back to my studio to sweep up and clean the place so I'd be able to get my deposit back. I went into the bathroom and looked at the mirror to see a message from Lourdes, written in red lipstick, saying, I'm going to miss our little fuck shack, you horny old goat, with a little crying sad face drawn underneath. It broke my already broken heart. I locked the door to the fuck shack for the last time, walked slowly through the courtyard and out to my car, feeling somber and scared about the future. As I drove up the freeway into downtown, I was in a panic. Am I doing the right thing? I thought to myself. I could have stayed put and dealt with commuting up to L.A. to help out when I could. I had Lourdes back for the moment. Maybe she'd come to the conclusion that I was the only one crazy enough to be totally devoted to her and would start the process of finally leaving the butcher the way she kept promising she would. I felt like I was leaving behind my only chance. But that was kind of the point. I had been too accommodating. It was her turn to prove her devotion to me. I pulled up to the building and parked in front. It felt good to be able to come and go and not worry about losing a parking space. It felt like a good omen. I got Mona from the room and took her for a long walk. She came alive and almost seemed to remember all the smells on the street she had once sniffed when she was six years younger. I remembered them too. 
We saw more old friends on the street. There were hugs and good feelings and lots of belly rubs for Mona. It felt very good to be welcomed back to the neighborhood with such love and warmth. It made me remember why I loved living there for as long as I did. We went back to the room and watched out the window at the fireworks exploding over Dodger Stadium and listened to the many gunshots being blasted over the bridge in Boyle Heights. I got everything unpacked and organized. I was hot and tired. I had an air conditioner at the studio in Long Beach, and the weather was just cooler there overall being next to the ocean. I had forgotten how hot it could get in downtown. Luckily, I was ready and had two box fans that I stuck in the window to get air flowing in. It was hot air, but air nonetheless. I went down the hall to shower and came back and jumped in bed. In the middle of the night, I felt a terrible itching all over. I got up and turned on the lights to find my bed covered with bed bugs. My only thought... What the fuck did I get myself into?